today we start with Jeannie Langford. She always kicks off our program and she always closes our program. So Jeannie, we're so happy to have her. Jeannie was born in Narrows, Virginia and has lived in Hopewell since the age of three. She graduated from Hopewell High in 1974 and attended the College of William and Mary where she focused her studies on history. Ms. Langford is employed by the Appomattox Regional Library System. She is an assistant librarian and the archivist for the Ann K. and Preston H. Leak Local History and Genealogy Room. Ms. Langford is certified in museum management, having graduated from in March uh, 2013 from the Virginia Museum Association's program. She's currently pursuing an advanced certificate in collection care through the Virginia Association of Museums. Ms. Langford resides in Hopewell with her daughter, son-in-law, and two wonderful grandchildren, and she expects great things to come from the local history and genealogy room, and I would agree with that. So, today, Jeannie is going to honor us with a program that she did years ago, and it was a request from my mother for her to repeat this, so she thought this year would be a good year to repeat it. So thank you, Jeannie, for that. The presentation that you're about to enjoy is the Sweet Strings and Swaying Skirts, the story of the Two Bees Royal Hawaiian Orchestra. Silent and forgotten for nearly eight years, the Royal Hawaiians burst back into the limelight of the 2002, the search for one of Hopewell's greatest treasures, was truly a labor of love and an eye-opening experience. With support from friends and families of the orchestra, the Hawaiians were given back their voices, names, and faces. The Hawaiians took the Virginia Roots music exhibit by storm and stole the show. You will hear many familiar names and see wonderful artifacts. So Jeannie, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's always my pleasure to be here. In all these years, I've never repeated a program, but Ms. Ann asked for this one, and it was too late to change last year, so this program is for her, and to relive the wonderful memories of this amazing group of people. In 1925, the Two Bees Corporation, which is where the ethanol plant is, was in full bloom. They were making rayon, artificial silk. They were employing thousands of people, both men and women. Two Bees had a similar philosophy to DuPont. They like to provide outlets for the employees, like tumbling, or singing, or um, baseball, softball, basketball. They always like to have an outlet for their employees. In 1925, WRVA came on the air. And of course, it was difficult because it was almost all live entertainment. Well, every Wednesday night was Hopewell night on WRBA. They would load up different entertainers and go to the radio station and perform. But the hit of the entire program was the TV's Royal Hawaiian Orchestra. Um, they performed a very different sounding music. You may have heard some of it this morning. The group consisted of both men and women. And I'm going to read off, we'll give you some very familiar names. Albert Colby was the lead guitarist. In 1929, he purchased the absolutely gorgeous Chrysanthemum National Guitar. He paid $229 for it. 
it was a resonator, which meant that it kind of was a, a form of better acoustics and was louder. And it was intended to be played as a steel guitar. <coughs> he paid the company back $3 a month until it was paid for. The guitar still exists. It is in Florida, the last that I knew, and its value 20 years ago was over $200,000. I don't know what its value is today. Walter Chetterington, many of you will know him. He was part of the group. He had a magnificent voice and had been in the White Star Minstrels, which was connected with the Titanic. He was supposed to be on the Titanic, but they changed their mind at the last minute and left the minstrels behind and just took the orchestra. Lucky for him. Some of the women who were in the group were Bertha Webb. Bertha Webb would become known as Mrs. Woodson Powers, the owner of Blackwell. And anyone who went in Blackwell's knew when the phone rang and it was Miss Bertha, Mr. Woodson became very calm. He didn't argue much with Miss Bertha. Katie Futch was a member of the Lions. She later married Pookie Dice and became a nurse. The group played in many different places over the course of their time from 1925 to 1934. They played at the mosque, which is now the Altria, three times and sold it out every time. They also made, I found this intriguing, a yearly visit to the state penitentiary to perform for the inmates. Now they did not take the dancing girls but they did take a couple of female vocalists and according to the prison newspaper, the inmates very much enjoyed the Royal of Hawaiian Orchestra. They played at dances at the high school. They also down at the end of 3rd Street was the old Two Bees Hall before it was torn down. They played there frequently. And one of the people who helped me tremendously with the project was Mrs. Helen Elliott and if any of you remember she was always well dressed and just the nicest lady you ever want to meet so she started telling me about the Hawaiians and you don't ever think about your parents or grandparents doing the same things that you did but she used to sneak out of her house when she was a teenager and go down to the two meetings of hall, she had to stay outside and listen to the music. As their fame grew, they were contacted in 1929 by OK Records. And they were asked to come to New York and record. <clears throat> we got the original set of records from a family member and what they are are six records. One song on each record, 78. The thing of records probably weighs like 15 pounds. But they were an instant hit. The records sold all over the country and recently a set of them was found in Australia. The music is beautiful to listen to. It's very soothing and very exotic. They continued to play together until 1934. And that is the year of the great strike at TV's. Many of the men were accused of turning off the power to the plant. Some of the women didn't even know that they voted to strike. They were just escorted out of the plant. So TV's what the workers didn't know was that TVs was really holding all the cards. Because you see, the new viscose process was coming into style 
and they had built the plant in Rome, Georgia, which did that. The Tubies plant here was doing the nitrocellulose process and really hadn't made any money since 1929. So when they decided to go on strike, they really kind of cut their own throat without knowing. So the music stopped. Many of the men were forced to go to other places to find work because none of the other plants would take them because they might have been a troublemaker. Some of the women stayed here and because two bees left open the knitting and dyeing area and that was predominantly for women. And so some of them stayed here. But many of the men had to go work elsewhere. And Mr. Coley was one of the union organizers. So he wasn't going to get back into a plant. But he had a better idea. He was going to go into the ice cream business. How many of you went in Coley's? Well, Mr. Coley and Mrs. Coley started the ice cream business and then it was right next to the high school, which meant they got the foot traffic from the older kids. And they had great ice cream, great food, and he ran a pretty tight ship. He didn't let a whole lot of trouble going on. In the meantime, Mr. Coley had been asked in 1934 by another group to come and play the guitar with them and travel on the roads. Well, Mrs. Coley said over her dead body was he going to become in a traveling band. So he continued with the ice cream. Unfortunately, his guitar playing days would be short. Mr. Coley accidentally cut off his fingers in the milkshake machine and you can't play a big slide guitar with missing fingers. So another one of the people was W.D. Davis and Mr. W.D. Davis was cut out by the strike but he and his wife went down to and on to found the Virginia Diner and he started another group down there in Sussex County and they played some on the radio during the 30s. Well, until 1998, nobody really talked about the Alliance anymore. Most everybody had forgotten about them. And two young, well, two young librarians walked in to the library in the old building. And they looked a little scruffy at first. That would have been Dr. Kimball, Greg Kimball, and Dr. Ron Curry. And they walked in and they asked, does anybody know about the TV's World Hawaiian Orchestra? Well, everybody kind of said no, but I said I do because I had seen them in the TV spinneret. They said, even though the project we're working on is roots music, which would have been things like the Carter family and different other early artists. He said, we're interested in them. I said, well, okay, I'll get to work. So I spent the next two years digging in microfilm until I was always blind, talking with people, and their family members, and all of a sudden, they decided they would really like to feature them in the Big Roots music exhibit. Well, I cannot tell you what the family did. Kay Judson's cousin sent the guitar up here. And that was the most beautiful thing I'd ever laid my eyes on. Kay, and you'll see it over here on the table, had in her house in Nebraska one of the original grass skirts. You'll notice it's still after all these many, oh, 93 years still holding its color. So I began to dig more 
And then lo and behold, in the door walks John Stallings of McKay's Hardware page. And John has a suitcase. He says, I think I have something for you, Jeannie. So he opens up this old, old suitcase. And in it are, is music from the Hawaiians, applause memos from WRBA, the Beacon magazines, little love letters to different members of the band that still smelled like perfume so that you could uh, ask it for pictures. And I said, well, John, how did you get this? He said, well, I was kicking around in the dump one day and it just was there. And so I took it home and I opened it and then I closed it. I said, well, this is amazing, John. I said, now, I want to make you part so that the Library of Virginia knows that you are a big part of this. John said, at the current time and considering the way I found it, I'd rather not be identified. <laughs> so I codenamed him Dumpster Dude, and that's the way a lot of this information got up to the Library of Virginia. Finally, about four years later, John decided that it would be okay to mention his name in the reflection on this. And I was very tickled because he deserved a whole bunch of credit for what he had found. And personally, I don't see much shame in kicking around in the dark, you know? <clears throat> so these things came in and got time to send them to Richmond. And I can't tell you how bad I wanted to touch that guitar. Just one hat and pick the strings on it. But you're not allowed to touch an artifact like that. So I waited patiently and I never did get to touch it. But after four years, the exhibit opened in Richmond. And if you, any of you knew my husband, he wasn't much on his fancy food for things, but he did take me up there. So we get there and it's beautiful. You can see the grass skirt in the case and the guitar and the music. and It's just absolutely astounding what was able to be accomplished. And so I'm sitting in the audience and one of the proudest moments I think that I've had was when they announced our library and myself because we were the only non-academic library in that entire exhibit and that was quite an accomplishment. Dr. Kimball, Greg Kimball, still does talks about the Hawaiians He's done them in North Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. They're still a big part of his life as they are of mine. And a truly amazing, amazing story. And I'm so glad that they were not forgotten. I hope that we can continue to with the Beacon being open and our music programs in the schools, that we can continue to encourage young people to go into arts and music so that maybe someday we can produce something like that again. Something absolutely amazing. And what I want you to notice about them is how neatly they're dressed. They actually had a person called the wardrobe censor. Now the wardrobe censor's responsibilities included making sure every single pant was pressed properly, every shoe was polished, and that the girls were not overly revealing. 
So that was his job, and he traveled with them everywhere. So that's the story of the Royal Hawaiians. And I invite your questions and encourage you to look at these wonderful, wonderful artifacts. And once again, it has been my pleasure to be with you and just enlighten on something that we forget about because we forget about a lot of things and they're worth thinking about. And thank you, Kay. I appreciate you bringing that in because it made my day. Thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm now open for your questions. Please. Yes. Is this the only Royal Hawaiian Orchestra that there was? Or no one was it? Or was there other to be planned? They did not have one at Rome. Rome was built in the late 20s. You now, Rome had baseball, etc. But I have never seen in any of the spinnerets any mention of anything like this with the Rome plan. Now, there were other Hawaiian sounding orchestras out there, and because people had never really heard those sounds before or a guitar played like that, they very much fell in love with it because it was exotic and it was different. It was not just a fiddle, it was very different. And their harmonies were beautiful. Everything about them was just to sit in front of the radio with your family and relax and enjoy the music. Yes, Dr. Uh, Scott. Where did they perform? Where did they? Where did the band perform? Where? 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 All, all over. They performed in Richmond at the Boss. They performed at the State Penitentiary. They performed in Hopewell. They performed in New York. They performed some in North Carolina because Mr. Coley and his brother Robert were originally from North Carolina. They came up here to get jobs at TVs. So they performed in a wide variety of places. Where did they perform in Hopewell? Um, in Hopewell, in the old high school's auditorium, and in particular, sometimes over in the park where the river walk is and also at the tv's hall which was at the end of third street north third no that would have been dr wilson bought the city point in in 22. i have never seen them perform there, but they may hate. They also did perform in the Beacon as well. Is there any recorded music? From yes, the I will. I've had it playing this morning, but I will turn it back on shortly. Is there any connection in your in your findings researching this? Any connection between Miss Mary Morris uh, and? The I am quite sure there is, in the main part, because of the girls. Some of the girls may have been in some of the rooming houses because they were still single. And she probably had, I've never seen a direct reference to her, but I am quite sure that with the girls involved, she had something to do with it. You may have mentioned this already, but Salem Norman, who actually got this started, did they have any professional musical training? I have never seen that they had professional musical training. Mr. Coley probably started it, Albert and his brother Robert, because they were from North Carolina, and apparently they were both extremely talented musicians. So they probably grew up in a household where there are other musicians. I don't think anyone was classically trained. Now the girls would have been probably very agile dancers because many of them belong to the TV's tumblers. 
which was a very wonderful tumbling team they had. So they were very limber and um, very athletic. Behind Patrick Oakley, you can still see a very small part of that bandstand. That that um, amphitheater that was uh, back there, kind of like a shell. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people didn't realize when you're in the background, <laughs> Patrick Oakley's going to play the way that he went like this. That was the way to see. That's the way to see. There were no mm -hmm. seats there. You sit on the ground. The ground. Here. They realized they had the big open expanse and then they had the bowl. Mm -hmm. But yeah, because I, I, I finally found a picture in an old newspaper of it. And um, like I said, you sat on those bumps, no seating. Yes, Elliot. Jeannie, is there any way we could um, put the music on the website from the library so that people like them can download it and share it with the next generation? It all depends on if it's still covered by copyright. No, if it's covered by copyright, if it's in public domain, yes. But it's probably real close to public domain because it's 93 years old. Okay. That's right. Can we look at that? Okay, thank you. Jeannie. You, you mentioned the tumblers. What were some of the other things the two piece had? They had a lot of activities. They had the tumblers, men's and women's basketball. Uh, they did minstrel shows. They did. They had a colored quartet that also went up to sing on Wednesday nights. They had a variety of opportunities for their employees to do something outside of work. They they kind of had that philosophy and DuPont did the same thing. I think their philosophy is a happy worker and a busy worker doesn't give you problems. So if you're keeping them occupied, not just at work, but elsewhere, you're going to have less problems with them, and they're probably going to be healthier workers too. Another two piece had a baseball team. A very good one. Yeah. Yes, Chris. And Jeannie, um, I know that football is a different community today because we don't have these mega industries that sponsor, you know, athletics and cultural events and all. Thing that they did. Um, but are there any lessons in the Two Beats Alliance for how we could uh, have more you know, artistic and musical and cultural events? I think we all would like to see the industries do more. I remember when I was a child, and even in my teenage years, every single one of these plants had a softball team. And the big thing was to go up back behind the new high school and watch softball. They even let the trustees out from the reformatory to play softball. But I would, I would like to see more community involvement, more community involvement with our youth, whether it's sponsoring football, youth league football or baseball, but to get that community connection back that seems to have gone missing sometime in the 60s. We're now past the fire station, we'll see the room. Right at the end of the room, we'll turn the left. If you go right, you can look at that. There's a, actually a baseball I know. standing up there that looks like a miniature of uh, Wrigley Field. I know. I, 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 it, it, it's, it, Mm -hmm. uh, Firestone, and then they had several, well, then they played a lot of the Riverside Park. 
And Hercules evidently had one of their own alt as well. well so they. Back, back in the, uh, back in the place here about the story, you know, mm -hmm. here about the Mark, can you tell us again about yours? Yeah. You'll see that. The Yellow Gate. It's on Allied property. But if you there, there's a Yellow Gate. And then we'll just walk up that road and it sits right there. Yeah, Daddy, we used to, uh, in the 60s, go up there and um, watch because Daddy used to take us to all the softball games and stuff. Daddy, you know, one of the issues is, like Chris's comment, is in those days, the management had to live here also. Mm -hmm. You're now the directors of the city department. So, you know, we don't have that community. Just after you work, they just take off and go. And I'm not talking about the people who live here that live close. I'm talking about 30 miles away and stuff like that. So, you lose community in that too. I think that affects it. Also, after the plant thing came church software. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, you know, a lot of people in the truth played, uh, played church league softball, and it was a big, big deal. And some of them even had, um, some of the church leagues even had basketball. I don't remember that the plants ever had basketball. I don't think they did. Well, they, they had a men's league here at Blackwell's. Uh, yeah. Two big teams were BFW and uh, Women of the World. Whopper Burger. Whopper Burger. Daddy used to take us to those too. Old Richard Reed and Billy Covington and all. Were most of the players and really come home well on this surrounding area? That was a time that we're having another influx, like the DuPont days, where people came from all over the place. Well, you didn't get too many, as many people from foreign countries to come to work at GBs, but they were coming because the money was good, so they were coming out of Carolina, uh, West Virginia. So probably the biggest part of them weren't born here. They moved here to go to work at the plant. Yeah, they sent uh, a group of French, well, they learned to speak English, but um, of French speaking Belgian ladies over here to train the American ladies how to run the machine or do the knitting and dyeing. So they were here for about a year training. And what was kind of unique about Tubies was Tubies had almost as many female employees as male employees because they were producing it, then they were finishing it and knitting and dyeing it. And the women had a better eye for fine detail with the knitting and the dye. So you've got all these things going on. So you had a lot of women working in that plant in the 1920s and early 30s. Uh, was Tubies in Firestone at the same? Plant? Same general location. Pretty much where the ethanol plant sits. Went to Tubies to Salonese to Firestone, then it was supposed to be the outlet mall. That was a disaster. And then finally we got the ethanol plant. Firestone bought that property in 1955 and they opened the plant in 1959. It had nothing to do with Salonese or anything. They bought they, they made synthetic fiber. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think they did. 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 They did
But I'm going to go over now if there are no more questions and fix the music again so you can hear them. And it has been a joy and a pleasure to be with you all, and I appreciate it greatly. Thank you.